Thank you for joining us. I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. Today I have the privilege of introducing Catherine Austin Fitz to our Financial Repression Authority viewers. Catherine is the president of Solari Inc., the publisher of the Solari Report, and managing member of the Solari Investment Advisory Services. Welcome, Catherine. Hey, Gordon. It's a pleasure to be on with you. I have, we haven't had you on the Financial Repression Authority, but I, we had a great discussion, I guess going back a couple of years ago now, at, at the macro analytics, and, I, and I'm really looking forward to getting caught up, and there's so much to talk about. Catherine, a lot of our listeners may not be familiar with your background, and you have an incredible background. Could you just give them kind of an overview of things you've been involved with in your career? Sure. I, was, uh, I worked on Wall Street for many years. I was a partner and managing director of a member of the board of Dylan Reed and Company, which is now, uh, you know, got sold and is now part of UBS. And then I went to work in the first Bush administration as Assistant Secretary of Housing. That's the person who manages and runs the FHA, which is a multi-billion dollar mortgage insurance operation. As you know, the mortgage markets are very socialized and uh, was extremely uncomfortable with the mortgage fraud and corruption that I ran into. When I left, I had discovered the internet, so I started an investment bank and financial software developer in Washington, and my hope was to use the internet and uh, software tools to really re-engineer uh, how communities could manage and, and sort of free themselves of government. Um, I've had a long-standing interest in freedom, and um, the company was very successful. We ended up doing uh, becoming the lead financial advisor for HUD and ran into the same corruption and ultimately I had to shut the company down and litigate with the federal government for 11 years, which had the results of me becoming a much more public person. I, I realized to uh, not only to win the litigation, but literally to stay alive and survive physically, I was going to have to go public. And so I delved really into trying to understand the covert side of the economy and integrate that. And in 2000, uh, seven after I settled the litigation, I started an investment advisory company. I'd gotten so many requests going from people as I was doing radio shows asking me, you know, what, what do I do? What do I do? How to protect myself? And then um, a year later, we started uh, the Solari Report, which is a, uh, a weekly interview and um, market review that I do. And it's really to help people who are trying to understand how to navigate in a world where the corporate media is completely, you know, is arguably the most corrupt aspect of the society that we have to navigate. So it was really designed for people who are interested in being free um, and being financially independent in the midst of what's going on. And so I published the Solari Report and, um, uh, and have a small investment advisory practice where I just uh, consult with people. I don't manage money. And uh, I live in Hickory Valley, Tennessee, far, far away from the centers of political and financial power because I find that it helps me to keep my perspective. And if I lose it, I go talk to the cows. <laughs> but, I, 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 but looking at your travel itinerary for the last month, you also get, get do a lot of traveling. Oh, I'm on the road tremendously. I mean, in the last, I, you know, I usually, it's rare that I spend a month in only one country. <laughs> That, that was kind of my observations as a subscriber to Solari. I've, I've, uh, I've, I've noticed that. Kat, I want to jump in. The last time we talked, we and, and you've coined the expression I'm better than anybody called Mr. Global, uh, which really reflects the, 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 the power structure that acts behind the scenes on a global basis. To, but you were speculating at the time or giving a lot of deep thought to whether we were engaged in a, in a global debt for equity game that was going on, and I haven't talked to you since then. And I wonder if you could just, what? How's your your thinking progressed on that thinking, or have you concluded it's correct, or or what's happened since we talked on that? Well, I still think it's 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 in in process. Although I think it's going to be a right now we're far from, uh, you know, it's going to take a long time. This is not a quick thing. Um, and I would just say it's an equity for debt swap. Basically what we've done, Gordon, is we have ginned up the economy financially by doing two things for, for 50 to 70 years or since World War II. One is, is basically draining the ecosystem. So 
sort of, sort of exploiting the environment, and the other is issuing goo gobs of debt. And, um, and as that debt's grown and grown, we've been on what some people refer to as the debt growth model. So you grow the economy by issuing more government debt. Um, and we have literally evolved an infrastructure and a leadership of people who really don't understand or have never participated in markets. You know, they don't understand market economies. They understand command and control economies. And I don't mean the Soviet Union. I mean you know, the G7 and particularly the United States. And and we are coming, there's a great quote that I used in the second quarter wrap up um, from the German finance minister who said, uh, this is at the G20 meeting in Shanghai, said, the debt growth model is over. Now, I keep using this quote because this has profound implications. It's like telling a family that's been on a, you know, been receiving methadone or methadrine or drugs for, for 70 years, that the drugs are about to stop. And what you're talking about is a radical and very deep reorganization of the entire economy because we've literally been living on debt growth and that debt growth is slowing. And the question is, okay, well, what do you do? Now, part of the challenge of being in a debt-based economy, Gordon, is the fact that people get out of alignment. So I can make money on your failure and you can make money on my failure. There's no better example than what has happened with student loans in this country. We're literally, we're watching an entire industry make more money from their borrower's failure than their borrower's success. So you, you know, I always say debt equals war and equity equals peace. So, so I believe we're gonna have to convert to an equity economy and, and an equity-based model, one of the reasons I know we can do that is the technology that is sort of in the lab or coming out of the lab or available to sort of kickstart or really radically increase productivity, whether um, you talk about things like robotics or automation or um, um, certainly energy technology, we have the ability to radically bring down the energy. That's the basis for, for converting to an equity economy. Um, and when you're integrating very complex uh, equity at fantastic speeds, equity builds a much more aligned model between the parties. So I think we're coming into literally uh, a debt for equity swap planetary wide. My big question, of course, is the Tina Turner question. We can do this nice or rough. <laughs> and it's funny. When I first started looking at the equity for debt swap, when I was the Assistant Secretary of Housing, my, um, I was going through the foreclosure property, and before the RTC was created, I was the number one landlord in the world as a result of foreclosures. And um, <coughs> my, my staff brought in, we are looking at the foreclosure property, and we realized we had one town in New Mexico where 70% of the mortgages in the entire town were in default and owned by Freddie Fannie and FHA. And I said to the, that my, my staff was proposing that we do aggressive servicing. And I said, well, that's ridiculous. There's no point in aggressive servicing this town. The town needs to reinvent its entire economy. Let's do an equity for debt swap. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, let's take all them. Let's round up all the mortgages. We'll put it in an entity. We'll issue equity. We'll, we'll swap the mortgages for an equity you know, an equity interest, and then we'll use that vehicle to reinvent and redevelop the economy in town. And um, they just said, well, you know, the town can't do that. They have no money. I said, well, wait a minute. I'm from Wall Street. You know, we never had any money. We used other people's money. We just, you know, invented trusts and, and, uh, and, and corporations and, and issued securities. And we can do the same thing here because we need to get out of debt and into equity. This town will never, you know, the town will never be able to generate new uh, economic value without this. Other, you know, and our mortgages are going to be worthless. Um, and they just looked at me and said, well, that's completely crazy. And that's when I realized, okay, you know, this is going to take a long time, this change. But uh, whether you look at it on a, on an individual municipality, if you look at it when you're looking at Puerto Rico, if you look at it when you're looking at every county in America or around the world, um, uh, an equity for debt swap is what's going to happen. 
um, Catherine, you you all you also said in your in your introduction for the second quarter wrap, when you were talking about the debt growth model is done, you said we're entering a period of institutional reform, and 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 a big part of that is going to be, and the question most important was who's going to lead, and that is always a delicate one when you get change going on. Comments there? Yeah. So here's my question, and it goes back to nice or rough. Um, we have two challenges. One is that. Um, uh, the leadership that we've we've developed over the last fifty to seventy years is our leaderships who know how to rig things with you know with basically free government money and a low cost of capital. They don't know how to work in a world where capital is dear and and you've got to optimize particularly fundamental economics. So that's one problem. The other problem is you know when I say we can do an equity for debt swap, there are two ways to do it. One is on a managed process where you realign, you know, bottom-up, uh, step-by-step. The other is where you just write everything down in a process that, as you know, can be very, very ugly. Um, so are we going to crash up the equity markets, or are we going to, you know, are we going to foreclose and bankrupt everybody? There, there are two ways to go. That's what I mean, nice or rough. And so whether it's the financial engineering choice or the leadership choice, do we change to leaders who are who are competent to run, you know, a market economic process, or uh, or do we stay with basically, you know, the Soviet style leadership? If you look at certainly, if you look at the Democratic nominee, that's what we've got. And um, and are we going to do it with a crash up of the equity market or or a jam down of the debt? Catherine. I, I want to make sure we have time to go through the some of the key highlights of your friend, your outstanding Q2 report. I have up uh, a chart that summarizes the, one of the sections, the economy and financial markets in it, and some of the key some of the key areas that you're highlighted on it. Is there anything in there that's particularly important that you would like to raise with our listeners? I know your views on Brexit were quite unique in what you thought the out- outcome was there, or why the outcome. Gordon, what we do at the Solari Report is four times a year we publish a wrap-up. So we have an annual wrap-up, and then we have three quarterly wrap-ups. And so every three months, subscribers are getting a wrap-up, and there's a section in the wrap-up called News, Trends, and Stories. And that's what you're referring to is our write-up on News, Trends, and Stories. And what we've discovered is our subscribers are unbelievably busy. And what we, what our goal with the wrap-ups are is that if you have no time to read the news or the media, and you just read those wrap-ups four times a year, you will know more about what's going on than, you know, than if you watch the corporate news. So that's our goal with this section, is to give you the highlights of the most important trends going on that's going to impact particularly your finances, whether it's your business or your, your personal finances. Okay, so to me, the number one most important thing that happened in, um, in Q2 was Brexit. Because you literally had the, the UK saying, okay, that's it for centralization. We're backing down. We're backing out of the EU. Um, that was very much uh, highlighted by the corporate media as something that was coming from the people. I don't believe so at all. I think that you had financial interests in the city and you had uh, leadership within the British establishment, including the royalty that said, you know, it's time to get out. I think one of the reasons that they wanted to get out, in fact, was not to get away from Germany and France, but to get away from the U.S. and the U.S. domination in Europe. Uh, I think England is very concerned about where the United States will go if it continues to push the unipolar model, particularly if it continues to push a new Cold War with Russia. And they want to make very sure that, that as that process rolls out and we switch from a unipolar to a multipolar world that they and their intelligence offices are very much in control of what happens to British policy and they can't get tricked or roped into anything including by the Americans. You, you, you also you talked about besides the the switch from unipolar to multipolar also some basic issues associated with preservation of culture was a peak a big drawing part of the of the of the vote by uh, by Britain. Could you expand on that? 
Sure. So the British have for many centuries been a leader on the financial side. If you look at the financial markets globally, it's the Anglo-American alliance that's dominated. And of course, the city is one of the most powerful financial centers in the world, if not the most financial, uh, most powerful. There are more billionaires in the city, you know, by any other measurement per capita, per whatever, than I think anywhere on the globe, including now even China. So, um, so the city and, and, and the Brits are very, very powerful. And one of the things they know is that um, all financial liquidity depends on faith in the rule of contracts and the rule of law. And if you look at what the, how the Americans have managed the financial system for the last three decades, um, you know, it's basically the, the Americans are basically developing a brand of organized crime. And, um, and, and I think that's a big problem for the Brits because the Brits understand that life is long. It's a much more ancient culture. Um, and, and the other thing is that they, and the Commonwealth, basically, if you, if you look at their trading positions, um, Asia and China is becoming much, much more important to them. And they are finding themselves, I believe, in too many conflict of interest positions between the U.S. interests and what the U.S. wants to do and what they can do globally through the Commonwealth given their century-old trading relationships. You know, their relationship with China is very long, very old, and very deep. And so I think the, the Brits feel a real need to preserve their culture. Um, you know, the issues on immigration are very serious. And, and threatening that culture, but it's also what, what the U.S. and NATO is doing. So I think the Brits are just saying, you know, if you look at what's happening with, with the trading accounts within the Commonwealth, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and where our economics are going, our bread is buttered on the side of being a free agent in a multipolar world. Uh, and I, I would I would would comment uh, for a lot of Mer Americans, uh, Catherine Arndt is familiar the, the dominant position, the London, British financing, the British investment banks have in Asia because, you know, the Singapore, Hong Kong, if you've been to a lot of the centers, they are former British colonies and that whole banking structure is, is alive and well. So, uh, and, and it's so evident when you spend any time in Asia to know the dominant role that, not the United States, but in fact Britain has. Well, it's not, it's not just there. It's the offshore havens. I mean, the Brits basically own and control and run the offshore havens. Now the U.S. is trying very hard with what it's doing in some of the states to, to make the United States the preferred offshore haven. But um, if, you add, if you add all the trading relationships, particularly in Asia, and you add the, the Brits' role in the offshore havens, I, if I were the Brits, I would very much want to be free of too much of the pro-centralization control and dominance. In your, in your other section, I have up here your geopolitics uh, wrap, rather than just recapping, um, which I'm showing here on the right, but you, uh, you also talked what you should look for in third quarter, and you had three points up. Could you expand on those? Sure. So um, we're going through a very long-term rebalancing of the uh, relationship between China and the United States. So for two decades, China built its manufacturing uh, capacity and really built its economy by taking Chinese savings. The Chinese have a very high savings rate, and um, and we would borrow that money, and, and then we would use it to basically hand out government checks. Then everybody takes their government checks or their EBT card, goes down to Walmart and buys Chinese goods, and around, around we go. So the Chinese were basically financing the purchases we made, and China was using its, its manufacturing and economic productivity to keep our game going. Now the reality is China is, is, is needs to, uh, to diversify away from that, and they're using their economic prowess to basically finance other areas around the world, particularly on the Silk Road and, and in the emerging markets, and they're building their own consumer economy. And so as we adjust to that and they adjust to that, you're watching a lot of ruffled feathers. 
you're also watching tremendous concern because the economy, much of the push and growth in the economy has come from Asia. If China slows down, what's that going to do to the global economy? It's part of why you've seen commodity prices and the commodity super cycle really slow down. Um, so I think the the restructuring of China's economy and the rebalancing with the U.S. economy is going to, you know, is going to continue to uh, really drive the train. You know, it's been very interesting for the last year. Every time the Fed tries to raise interest rates, what they discover is, oh, now that we've lent money and have trillions of dollars of dollar demand when they do debt all over the world, um, when commodity prices are down, if they raise interest rates, you know, they slam the whole economy and they back off as much because of what's going on globally and sort of the dollar trap we have everybody in as opposed to um, the economy locally. Then um, finally, I think there are tremendous issues on productivity. It's why we focused our theme in the second quarter on productivity. What is happening, Gordon, is you're seeing real productivity uh, uh, growth slow down in the G7 countries and globally. Um, one, if you look at productivity in the emerging markets, you'll hear the expression convergence is an Asian phenomena. So Asian per capita incomes are merging towards the G7 per capita incomes. It's not happening in the other parts of the emerging markets. The productivity growth isn't there. So if you take a slowing productivity growth along with a slowing increase in the labor pool, um, what you're watching is you're not watching the kind of inflationary growth that we've had for the last 20 or 30 years. And that's a problem because if you look at how the economy works globally, Mr. Global, as you will, has been siphoning lots of money off. And you can't do that without more inflation, let alone you can't meet the pension obligations and retirement systems obligations in the G7 because you just had a financial coup d'etat and stole $40 trillion. Um, and so all of this is coming to a head, and the problem that the establishment has is the ways they can get really radical new productivity growth is with technology, um, so with robotics, with automation, with new energy technology that brings the price of energy down. The problem is that that is all highly deflationary. And so here they are in a terrible double bind. The more they implement things that give them productivity growth, the more deflation they get. Um, and that really conflicts with the fact that they want to continue siphoning off huge amounts of money, uh, a lot of it on an illegal or mysterious or secret basis, and that flies counter, you know, you really need an inflationary model to do that, and it's one of the reasons you're seeing more and more push for uh, invasive control, uh, invasive, just unbelievable control. NBC, I just put it up on my website at Solari.com, you can see it. NBC just gave a report on um, on how neat it was the idea of microchipping your child to make sure you knew where they were and that they were safe. And you know, I mean, it it's inconceivable to me. But that's the kind of control uh, you're looking at when people are concerned about these things. Catherine, uh, for the sake of time, I want to move on to the science and technology part. But specific to you've done. I would say leading yeoman work in in the area of, of space-based economy and thinking there, and I, and I have I haven't seen anybody talking about it or understanding it as well as as you have at, at Solari. Could you kind of give a thumbnail to our listeners of what you mean by space space-based economy and what's going on? Sure, I you know I backed into this, Gordon. I didn't. Uh, what happened was I, when I was litigating with the federal government, I was trying to figure out, we had enormous amounts of money disappearing. So we had trillions of dollars disappearing from uh, the U.S. government between 1998 and 2002. I was part of a group of people that got laws passed requiring audited financial statements, and it forced a process where they started to admit, you know, that you had trillions of dollars going missing. And I kept saying, you know, where's the money? Where's it going? Because I assure you, it was way more money than, you know, uh, makes, you know, buys Ferraris for Goldman Sachs partners. We're talking about, you know, the kind of money it takes to build, you know, colonies on Mars. It was huge amounts, trillions of dollars. And then, of course, we had the bailouts, and everyone kept saying, oh, it's mortgage fraud. Well, 
you know, the reality is we had $27 trillion of bailouts when $8 trillion would have retired all the residential mortgages in the whole country. So it's more than three times, you know, it's more than 300% your existing mortgage flow. Um, so we're talking about mammoth, the, I, I described the financial coup d'etat as $40 trillion went missing. You're talking about mammoth amounts of money. Anyway, so I started to investigate the black budget, trying to figure out where the money was all going. And <clears throat> what I discovered was there was a huge amount of money going into what I would call an underground, underground base infrastructure. But there was more and more <coughs> um, information to indicate that, that literally after the Kennedy administration, we took the space program dark. We took it black. And so I started to, to study what was going on in space, number one, uh, on the covert side, but also what I discovered, there's a tremendous emphasis going on on, on getting uh, or reinvesting in space, both on a governmental and private side. Um, right now, if you look at space programs around the world, guess how many people? There are approximately 250,000 that work in um, the U.S. space programs on the governmental side. Guess how many people in China work in the Chinese space programs? Double that? It's 350,000. So that's the governmental side, not, not. And what I discovered was there is a massive investment, particularly in Asia, India. Uh, I did a re review of a great book called Asia Space Race. If you look at the investment of what is going into space, the Chinese, the Indians, the Russians, the Americans, both in, in two respects, Gordon. One is, as we do more and more digitally, what is happening is the suborbital platform and the satellite systems are becoming more and more powerful within the global economy. I call them the sea lanes of the 21st century. So, so part of this is simply the orbital platform and the suborbital platform and what's happening there as it relates to our global economics. But then the other is what we're doing on the moon, what we're doing in the galaxy, what we're doing uh, with trying to build colonies on Mars. And there is a very significant investment. To my surprise, I ultimately came to the opinion, and this was what I published in, in the uh, annual wrap-up in January on the space-based economy, that the reason we had proceeded with the Uruguay round of GATT to globalize the economy was to create sufficient capacity to become a multi-planetary civilization. And a lot of the centralization you see, including in the financial system, is designed to facilitate that process. If you're going to become a multi-planetary civilization, remember the people who run the world really think in 100 plus year increments, then it's you know, you really do need to centralize much more in the financial system um, to sort of umbrella more than one planet economy. And, and the biggest question I have at this point is, is our current economy open or closed? I did a, a first quarter wrap up last year on called Planet Debt and did a very serious look at, at what has happened to, to debt, both private and public globally. And one of the things I discovered is you can find pretty good statistics on who is who has issued debt. You can find very little information on who owns that debt. And one of my questions was, you know, is our economy open or closed? And I think that's, given what's been going on, that's a very legitimate question. Anyway, I published Space-Based Economy in January, and I was thinking, Gordon, at the time, oh, this is so forward, this is so aggressive, this is so out there. Literally three weeks after we published it, um, or very shortly after we published it, Boeing did a spot at the Super Bowl called Just You Wait, about what our society was going to look like in 100 years from now. They had space elevators. They had, I don't know if you know what a space elevator is, but you basically get in an elevator and go up to the, you know, the International Space Station. And now with <coughs> new material sciences, you know, that is really a possibility. Um, but but they had colonies on Mars. They had the whole, they had the whole bit. And I thought, you know, well, so much for my stuff being aggressive. The other one that was very aggressive was Pepsi did an 18-minute sort of entertainment commercial, including the uh, references to you know satellites in the 1800s. So it's kind of interesting because of this enormous investment in space. 
The other thing I should say, I drive around the country a lot. And, and one of the things I realized about four years ago was every town I was going to was developing a spaceport. You're seeing spaceports, you know, popping up all over the country, and it's happening very quietly. You'll get coverage in the local press, but you won't get a big, you know, piece in Time magazine. So our entire society, whether it's the global space programs and what's happening in Asia or building spaceports in communities all over America, I presume all over the world, um, we are repositioning and making a massive investment in space. And it's getting so little visibility unless you're really looking for it, at least in the in the U.S. Uh, media. I, I, I've been watching since you put out that report, you know, the activities, as you point out, in China, in, in India, in Russia. I mean, it's, it, these are massive undertakings they're doing. And, and as you say, it's, it's massive. It's, it's not about United States financing. It's about where did all this global money go on a global basis? And, uh, and, and that's where the funding, funding of this magnitude of, infra, I'll call it infrastructure, future, future centralized infrastructure uh, appears to, uh, to go. Did, were you able to really prove that in following the money? Here's what you can prove. You can, you can prove, um, here's what you can prove. You can prove there are clearly hundreds of billions of dollars of, of underground infrastructure that has been built. So if you, uh, if you listen, we did a great Solari report on the underground base infrastructure with Richard Dolan, um, and I would encourage you to listen to that. So that has clearly been a very significant investment. If you look at the indications of a secret space program and, and all sorts of space capacity, that is uh, you know, clearly a very big and expensive investment. If you just look at what we're doing on the overt side, that's hundreds of billions of dollars. So that's all proven and documented. Um, the last thing I would say is if you certainly look at eyewitness testimony by credible witnesses as well as, you know, we have massive videotape evidence of the UFOs flying around the planet. I mean, at one point I sat down and said, look, this is $150 trillion of hardware that we have documented is flying around the planet. And um, whether it's coming from our, whether we're financing and building it or somebody off planet or underground is financing and building it, somebody's paying for this. And one of my questions, of course, is where is the industrial and manufacturing capacity to create all this stuff? So, you know, we know that Nazis were working on UFOs in, uh, you know, many, many years ago. So it's a, it's a longer, more complicated information. But if you just look at, at the infrastructure, which has been <coughs> documented by credible eyewitnesses or by video, you know, we're, we're talking in the, in the volumes of the trillions of dollars that have been disappearing. And um, if, you, if you dive into this stuff, for example, um, Ben Rich was the head of the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. Lockheed Martin is the largest defense contractor in the world. And I would also say runs a lot of the payment systems in the U.S. government, which is very convenient to, you know, redirecting the money if that's what's called for under national security. Anyway, but Lockheed, the head of Skunk Works at, at Lockheed in 1996 said, you know, we now have the technology to send E.T. home. And that's a, that's a direct quote from the head of Skunk Works. So, my, my read of this is that we as a society have developed technology way beyond, um, way beyond what the average person knows even exists. Um, I would say one other thing, because I, I believe that part of this money was shifted out, Gordon, as a financial coup d'etat. In other words, if you look at the people running the national security establishment, they basically, in 1995, gave up on the idea that they could run it responsibly through the U.S. Congress and administration and decided, you know, something, let's just take enough money out to endow um, a private financing infrastructure to build a global government without having to go through the U.S. budget. So I basically think, think of it this way, you know, for 70 years, we got everybody to pour money into pension funds, whether state, local, or federal government, or corporate, and, and pour money into Social Security, 
And then right before everybody started to retire, we basically said, okay, let's get all the money out and put it behind going into space as opposed to paying for nursing homes. And I think that at the, at the deepest level was the choice. Now, if you look at the technology coming out of the black budget and coming out of, um, you know, sort of places like Lockheed Skunk Work, if we really integrated that technology, we can jump the curve on both the standing of the U.S. dollar and jump the curve on dealing with all the debt because you're talking about bringing the cost of energy down 70, 80, 90 percent among other things and basically you know doing everything with robots instead of humans and so we have locked up enough technology to really deal economically with what we're, we're dealing with the problem is if nobody trusts the governance system and nobody trusts the leadership how, how's that going to work? Well, I noticed this week that our Congress, the United States Congress, uh, passed uh, or authorized uh, private corporations to uh, put men on the moon or pr do projects to the moon and colonies on the moon. And, uh, you know, kind of strange to me when I read it, and I says, why is this such a priority when we have huge other priorities more evident in the news? And I think you're beginning to answer it. There's a lot more going on here. Well, there's a lot more going on. I would say that if I was Mr. Global, becoming a multiplanetary civilization would be arguably my top priority. I think it's very dangerous. You know, I'm a risk manager by nature, so I think it is a terrible mistake to bet the future of the human race on one planet. I just think becoming a multiplanetary civilization is a very critical and intelligent thing to do. I also think that we're people who need... You know, we're a society that needs new frontiers, so I have to tell you, I totally embrace uh, becoming a multi-planetary civilization, although I don't necessarily like the way the leadership is going about it. Um, uh, now, I, sh I should point out, if you look at, at magazines and other information being targeted at young people, young people are being recruited to want to go work on space incredibly. I mean, you and I might not notice it, but let me tell you, the young people would be in America are being targeted, and it's space, 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 and that's one of the reasons in the wrap-up I go into the, um, into the use of the movies, because the movies are a big recruiting tool. And if you look at a lot of what's been going on in the movies, the movies are telling us about the importance of satellites and the suborbital and orbital platform and space exploration becoming a multiplanetary civilization. So... It's out there if you look. Um, Catherine, we, last subject before we, uh, we have to break. You've also done a lot of work on blockchain technology and trying to understand its ramifications. Conclusions you've reached on how important blockchain technology may become in the future? And, and the exposure to the financial, to Mr. Global and the financial system? Well, here's what Ms. I believe Mr. Global wants is a digital currency. You know, I've always said he doesn't care if it's wampum beads or dollar or, or yuan or whatever. He wants a digital currency. And, um, uh, and part of the reason is if you want to create a global currency, you've got to dra dramatically bring the transaction costs down to reach into the emerging markets, let alone the frontier markets. There's no way the emerging markets, you know, with their mobile phone systems can afford the kind of transaction costs we're paying in the G7 or even the G20. So, um, so, so getting a low cost, high speed digital infrastructure is important. And that is one of the reasons I should mention, Gordon, that I think the satellite, um, the satellite platforms are so important to where this is all going. Anyway, I've tried very hard to understand blockchain and I would say I have a lot more opportunity before I get there. Um, I, th I think blockchain is, is very instrumental to building very low-cost uh, digital global transaction systems because what you can do is you can, you can radically reduce a financial system out of very cumbersome payment systems. And, um, and blockchain enables you to do that. Basically, you can create an open-source ledger system and that would be quite, uh, that, if, if you could get that going and have it work, you could dramatically reduce um, 
transaction costs. It's interesting to note that before the Brits voted for Brexit, uh, the, the Church of, uh, not the Church of England, the Bank of England, was doing very significant work looking at blockchain and what it could do. And it wouldn't surprise me if part of this was the Brits saying, you know, we, we don't necessarily need the Americans to be a leader in the financial side. So, um, so I think blockchain is going to be very, very important, but how it rolls out is anybody's guess, and I think it's going to be very organic. I don't even think Mr. Global knows. The one place I would disagree with a lot of the, the technologists, they always say, look, this is totally encrypted, it's totally safe, this is private, and I say, hooey, Mr. Global never lets out anything that he doesn't have a backdoor for. So I don't believe it. I believe there's no such thing as technology that's going to be adopted that Mr. Global doesn't have it a backdoor for. Well, we just found out this week with Bitcoin there was, in fact, a backdoor to it, uh, as I think something like $60 million disappeared uh, off, the, uh, univer off the universal ledger somehow, uh, which shocked, shocked everybody, even the real believers, the true believers in it. Catherine, we're going to have to have to break now. Uh, great. There's just so much in your reports, always in your reports, and, and things that you discuss that nobody else uh, discusses. I have up here just a list of some of the things or the big questions that uh, that you also addressed in this month's report. And I, I, I leave those this as a challenge for our listeners or viewers to want to go to Solari and your, uh, your site and, and have a look at it. Any closing comments you'd like to leave with our listeners or messages? I think the fundamental issue is we live on a planet where the governance system is unclear and uh, invisible to us. And we're seeing more and more secrecy related to more and more amounts of the economy, particularly as digital technology allows centralization to happen. And secrecy leads to privilege and privilege leads to corruption. And um, if, you're, if you're in the financial system, you know how corrupt uh, or the extent of the corruption we're dealing with. And I think there's no way to heal that that problem without transparency. So I really commend you for what you're doing, Gordon. The more we can bring transparency to what's going on, um, uh, the more we can delete a lot of very expensive and harmful privilege and what it's doing to our environment and what it's doing to our economy and what it's doing to us and our personal freedoms. So let's bring transparency to this because... It doesn't have to be this way. In fact, if you could, you know, reintroduce market economies and get out of command and control economies, the wealth on planet Earth, given the technology that's becoming available, you know, is explosive. What the wealth currently is nothing compared to what it could be. Yeah, it has troubled me for a long time. You know, coming corporate life where 25 years ago we distributed everything. Internet technology allows decision making to be taken down to the lowest levels as we flatten corporations, etc. And yet we have the government going to a more and more of a command and control centralized structure, which is counter to everything that technology allows us to do to really create innov innovation, productivity, and individual uh, abilities. And it just it makes no sense until you have un until you have a clear understanding of what's really going on. And what the real strategies are and I don't think anybody's doing finer work than than you at Solari of asking some of these most fundamental questions and doing research that others may say is conspiracy but it's not it, it's some real hard realities and uh, that uh, and I'm sure you take a lot of flack for some of this but it's it's you know, you're the one of the very few people that is is, is raising it so, uh, Catherine in wrapping is how could our listeners follow your work the website and uh, where do you publish? Um, our, my website is solari.com, S-O-L-A-R-I.com. I have an online book called Dylan Reed and the Aristocracy of Stock Profits. It's at D-U-N-W-A-L-K-E-Dunwalkie.com. I get every time I, I try to publish it in hard copy, I get threatened. <laughs> so I just leave it up there online. Um, and I published this Larry Report. It's a subscription service. We have an interview and a money markets review every week. Just fabulous stuff archived going back to 2008. If you really want to understand what, what is going on in this world at a much deeper level and understand what to do about it, uh, you know, my goal is that you have a free and inspired life. So we have great subscribers. Um, <laughs> occasionally we get together and have wild times so um, 
So subscribe to the Solaria Report if you're interested. <coughs> Sorry, Gordon. We have lots of free Solaria reports that you can you can watch and try on the on the website. So uh, come into Solaria.com and give it a try. Catherine, I always enjoy the conversations, and you always provoke some thinking in my mind of things, other areas I want to go and look at. We'll have to have you back again, and and take care of that cold. I will. I, you know, I hate to say that. I hate to say this, Gordon. No, it's not traveling. Whenever I fly a U.S. carrier, I get a cold, and so I've now given. This is the last straw. I've now given instructions from now on. When I fly to Asia, or Europe, it's got to be a foreign carrier. <laughs> What do you think? I, I gotta ask you. What do you think? What do you think the, the correlation is there? I'll, I'll tell you what I think, because because I you know I travel so much and um, and so I you know I fly constantly on both foreign and domestic carriers. What I will tell you, and I I just spent almost two weeks in Switzerland, and and being in Switzerland or some of the Scandinavian countries, everything works, Gordon. And then you come back here. And nothing works. This is broken. This is broken. This is broken. This goes wrong. Your luggage doesn't show up. You know, you get sick when you fly. And and I just think the the American airline industry has been pumped and dumped consistently in a way that uh, you know we're watching a corporation whose goal is financial engineering and not customer service. So I I just I have to tell you if you look at the the quality of the performance of the transportation systems abroad versus America, it's, we are no longer a first world country. Without question. And anybody that does any traveling immediately knows that. And it's shocking for people that do their first traveling, they come back stunned at the difference. Because they, they have this image of where it used to be 25 or 40 years ago. And it just, uh, the world has moved on and our infrastructure in many cases is is crumbling no question zero question one trip abroad anywhere in the world and you'll understand that have to break Catherine have to have you back always enjoyed our discuss always enjoy our discussions and we'll talk to you again thanks Gordon thanks all the best